Hi everybody and welcome to Love Fraud Live. A reader once posed a question on lovefraud.com and here's the question. After what the sociopath did to us, does anyone trust other people? This reader described that she ran across a few sickos, as she called them, and now, whenever she meets anyone, she wonders who they really are. Do they have a secret life, like Ted Bundy or Scott Peterson? Is it possible to trust at all? I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'll explain the four steps of learning to trust again. This is a live streaming show, and I'll answer your questions at the end of this short presentation. To ask a question or join the chat, we ask that you subscribe, which you can do by just clicking the subscribe button. So yes, it is possible to trust again. First, some background. Antisocials and psychopaths make up 1% to 4% of the population. If we include other exploitative manipulators like narcissists, borderlines, and histrionics, that bumps up the number of disordered people to about 12%. But remember this, if 12% of the population is disordered, that still means that 88% of people are not sociopaths and may be deserving of our trust. So how can we feel trust again? How do we determine whom we can trust? Well, I think there are four steps to being able to feel trust and deciding who deserves to be trusted. Here's the first one. We need to educate ourselves. One of the statements that I've heard over and over again through emails and phone calls with survivors is this. I didn't know such evil existed. Well, now we know. We've all learned, mostly the hard way, about sociopaths. Now we know that they exist, and we must educate ourselves about the warning signs and the patterns of behavior that may indicate someone is disordered. What do they look like? Lies, irresponsibility, vague answers to questions, no long-term friends, magnetic charm, lavish flattery, statements that don't quite add up, flashes of violence. If we start seeing signs like these, we need to put up our guard. The second thing we need to do is believe our own instincts. Just about everyone who was victimized by a sociopath had an early warning. We felt a gut feeling that something wasn't right, an instinctive revulsion. We had questions about what was going on. Unfortunately, we ignored the signals. We didn't believe them, I think, for these three reasons. First of all, we didn't have the empirical knowledge that evil exists, so we didn't know how to interpret our internal warnings. Then, we viewed ourselves as open-minded individuals and believe that everyone deserves the benefit of the doubt. And finally, we allowed the sociopath to explain away our questions and doubts. Never again. We should never doubt our instincts. In fact, we should train ourselves to pay attention to our instincts. Our intuition is absolutely the best tool we have for steering clear of sociopaths. We must learn how to use it. So the third step is to make people earn our trust. Now, I for one had a blind spot. I'm an honest and forthright person. I would never think of using deception and manipulation to get what I wanted. Unfortunately, I thought everyone was like me. Huh. Big mistake. I have a younger brother who is in the construction business. Now, if you know anything about construction, you know how tough it is. So my brother's rule of thumb is this. Everyone is a jerk until proven otherwise. I've come to believe it's a useful philosophy. The point is that we should not give our trust away indiscriminately. People must earn our trust 
by consistent, reliable, and truthful behavior. Now, there's an important caveat. Sociopaths are quite capable of appearing to be trustworthy, dependable, and honest in the beginning while they're trying to hook us. So if the person was trustworthy, but then the good behavior slips and bad behavior starts to appear, we must recognize the change as a potential red flag. And finally, here's the last step in learning how to trust again, and that's to process our own pain. Now, I think the biggest roadblock to being able to trust again is this pain that we feel. With a sociopath, we've been deceived, betrayed, injured, emotionally crushed. We are angry and bitter, and rightfully so. But if we want to move on, we can't keep carrying the pain around. To get rid of it, we must allow ourselves to feel it. Now, I recommend that either privately or with the guidance of a good therapist, we let the tears flow, we let the wails flow, we let the curses fly. You also may feel anger, which is a physical sensation. Anger needs to be expressed physically without, of course, injuring others. My favorite technique was envisioning my sociopathic ex-husband's face in a pillow and beating it until I collapsed. However we accomplish it, we need to get the emotional pain out of our system. It's not healthy to carry our wounds forever. We do want to be able to trust again. Doubting and disbelieving everyone we meet is a really dismal way to live. If we cannot recover our trust in humanity, the sociopath who plagued us will have truly won. Now the difference is that after the sociopath, we must be smart about whom we trust and award our trust only to people who deserve it. So what does that look like? Well, now we know the red flags of a sociopath and in evaluating a person, we don't see them. Our intuition is giving us the green light. This person has proven and continues to prove to be reliable. From an intellectual perspective, we believe the person is trustworthy. But there's also an emotional aspect of trust. And by doing the work of releasing our pain, we clear the way for, to be able to feel it. Now this is important because feeling trust is what paves the way for feeling love. So that's the presentation for tonight. And next I'll be answering your questions. Again, please be sure to subscribe so that you can ask a question. You only need to be a subscriber for one minute to participate in the chat and ask a question. Now, when you do subscribe, you'll automatically be notified about all my new videos. Plus by subscribing, you'll boost the distribution of Love Fraud Live so you'll help spread the word about the dangerous sociopaths who live among us. And uh, we've also implemented Super Chat uh, on this YouTube show, which offers you the opportunity to contribute to Love Fraud's work. And we've received quite a few uh, donations uh, through the Super Chat, which I really appreciate. If you'd like to support us, all you have to do is click the dollar sign at the chat window and slide the button to the amount that you want to contribute. There's also a link in the description below the video window where you can make a tax deductible contribution to Love Fraud's work. Okay, well, we've got a question or a comment. Let me take a look and see what we have. Okay, Angel Marie says, how do I go from feeling numb to feeling the pain? I want to cry, but I am numb. I want to start the healing. Um, what you're experiencing is common. Um, and I, I don't think you should feel badly about the fact that you're, you're in this place. Um, I once was with, uh, I went to a seminar uh, of a woman who was a, a, a spiritual type of healer, but very practical. And she explained that sometimes we 
get so angry about what we experience or what, what is going on in our life or, or what is happening that it turns to rage. And if the rage has no place to go, it turns to numbness. So that could be where you are in that there's, there, there could be anger, there could be, um, and, and that's what's turning into numbness or, or it could be other emotions as well. Now, the other thing that can be going on is that sometimes we can't feel the fear, feelings because psychologically we're not ready to. Um, you know, sometimes people, especially if, if you're just coming out of a situation, you got to deal with the practical things of life and you know figure out how to get stabilized and things like that. And, and you simply do not have the psychological or emotional energy to actually start processing the pain. Um, if you're getting to the point where you've been away from this person for a while and you're starting to recover, um, I think you might be able to use pretty much the same process that I was kind of talking about um, a little bit earlier in that if you get to a private place, you know, where, where you're, you're just alone and allow yourself to think about a particular incident, just one particular incident and just kind of sit with it and let yourself start to really feel how that particular incident felt. Um, because whenever it happened, 10 to one, you probably suffered some kind of emotional wound, but you did not allow yourself to feel it. Um, often you can't, you, you might be in a situation where you, you have to wonder, you know, what, what the person's going to do next. You got to be sharp. You got to, you know, figure out how to take care of your kids or, or, or any number of things um, could have prevented you from feeling the emotions in the moment. And so consequently, you know, we, we lock it away inside and, and, you know, and, and throw away the key just about, you know, with a lot of emotions. So I think a, a way to do it is to just quietly sit and think about a particular incident perhaps one that was pretty painful or, or maybe that's too scary. You know, maybe you got to start with something that wasn't as bad. That was just annoying. Um, but the idea is to just kind of sink into it, sink into the memory and whatever you start to feel or experience, let it come up. Now it might not be crying at first. I mean, maybe it will be anger or maybe it will be a wail of some kind. Um, we usually have layers and layers of these emotions and the idea is just to let flow whatever happens and, um, it'll take time. Uh, it's not pretty. Uh, <laughs> I remember being curled up on the floor, uh, wailing and crying and everything. And the only, uh, creature that was here was my dog and it sure scared him. <laughs> but, um, to, you know, give yourself time and I mean, don't be hard on yourself for not getting there. So just, just allow it to happen. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My brother, my brother. Yeah. He's smart. My brother is smart. Thank you, Katrina. Okay. So Aaron says, honestly, oh, my sons, all four of them had, and now they are sociopaths or disordered. It's heartbreaking. How do you trust when the people you thought were going to be your family and friends? Oh, yeah. Um, that's a really, really difficult situation. It, uh, I'm reading here that it's your kids who are, um, disordered. Lots of people have been in that situation, you know, where they've, they married somebody, you know, 
thought they were doing a, a good thing, thought that the person was authentic, and and then discovered that their spouse was disordered, you know, was not the person that you thought he was or she was, but you've already had three or four kids with this person and you've established this household. I mean, I've, I've spoken to plenty of people who were married 20, 30, 40 years before they finally figured out why there was such craziness in their marriage and, and what was wrong with their spouse. Now, unfortunately, this condition is highly genetic. And even though you probably, I'm, I'm sure you did your best to try and raise uh, your children um, to be good people, sometimes the what has been inherited, which is called the genetic insult, uh, sometimes it is just so strong that it cannot be overcome. And if your boys are um, adults now, um, there might not be a whole lot that can be done. And it's very painful, but you have to put yourself first. I mean, in the end, the person we are truly responsible for is ourselves. Um, I'm sure you did your job, you know, when your kids were little, you did the best you could. If they've turned out that, you know, they've inherited the disorder, then, you know, it's the serenity pair, prayer, you know, change what you can change and the wisdom to know the difference. And, you know, maybe there isn't much that can be done. So there's a couple things you could do, um, depending on how difficult the relationships are. Some people decide that they can't be involved with them at all and decide to go no contact. Um, the other possibility is uh, low contact. And what that means is that you, you do have some kind of uh, surface relationship. You keep it cordial, but just not very deep. You talk about the weather and baseball or, or whatever. Um, and, and the reason you might wanna do that is because your, your children may marry somebody um, who turns out to not be disordered and they may have children who are not disordered. And you know, so sometimes there may be grandchildren that could possibly use some guidance from a, a normal person. So that's a possibility. So anyhow, you kind of have to recognize that you've done your best and decide what's best for you at this point. You know, if, if it's really too painful, you might have to break it off. Um, if maybe with some of the kids, you can have a surface relationship, then you could try that. But, but you know, you have to, you have to see and, and look closely at who the people are now and, and what you think um, you can live with. Okay. Okay, so Marsha asks, is road rage during driving a definite red flag? The, the narc I used pounded on the steering wheel uh, when he was frustrated. Um, road rage. Well, my ex-husband, who was a sociopath, def definitely engaged in road rage. He would, uh, in fact, I, I remember some incidents where I would try and slide down in the seat because he was being such an idiot you know, somebody would pass him and he'd get all mad and he'd wave his cell phone and threaten to call the cops and all this other stuff. And, oh God, it was a mess. So, um, yes, road rage can be a sign, although um, you, you want it to be one of multiple signs. I mean, just because a person has road rage, if you don't see other symptoms as well, then that's not enough to determine that they're a sociopath. But this person, if they're also lying, if they're also um, uh, you know, charismatic and charming and, and blames everybody else for everything that goes on, 
um, if they are violent in other ways, uh, violent towards uh, animals or property, uh, you know, any of the other red flags, um, if, if you start to see a whole pattern, then road rage can definitely fit into that. Um, so the answer is yes, it can be a sign, although not by itself. It, it would need to be part of a pattern of other behaviors. Okay. Okay, so Erin is saying um, about her kids that they were adopted. Well, um, that can be tricky also because you don't actually know who the parents are. Um, if they're not biological siblings, then you can still look at each one individually to see, um, see what they're like. But again, you know, if, if they're adults at this point and you're seeing this kind of disordered behavior, everything that I said previously applies. You, you just don't know, um, you know, where they came from. But if you're seeing the behavior by the time they're an adult, it, it doesn't matter. And you just need to make a decision about what to do. Okay. Okay, so Marcia says he displayed multiple red flags, love bombing, future faking, gaslighting, the whole smear. Well, in that context, then yes, road rage definitely uh, fits in with, it could be just another sign of um, someone's a sociopath. Okay. Well, I hope this has been helpful. Um, I didn't see any more questions for now, so I thank everybody for participating, and we will be here next week, uh, next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the next episode of Love Fraud Live. So thank you so much, and see you again.